Thank you for that very kind introduction and the promotion that it contained as well. The philosopher Tom Nagel famously worried whether we could ever know what it was like to be a bat. Nagel's worry was a worry about distance. He thought that a bat's sensory apparatus, its active sonar, is just so far from our own sensory apparatus that we can never know what it's like to experience the world as a bat does. Given that Nagel's worry is about distance, you might think that no such worry could arise in relation to your own experience. Worrying whether you know what it's like to be you would seem a bit like worrying how you're going to get yourself from New York to the Big Apple. I mean, you're already there. There's no worry. So in answering particular questions about our conscious experience, we ought to have no difficulty. This should be easy. Well, today I want to talk about one particular question to see if that's really so. And the question I want to focus on is perhaps the oldest question, at least one of the oldest questions in psychology. The question, how much can we see in a single glance? And to give you a flavor of what it's like to be a subject in an experiment, a standard experiment to, to test this question, um, we're going to run through one right now. Okay, so on the next slide, you're going to see a, a cross. I'd just like you to look at that cross. And then shortly afterwards, a display of 12 letters is going to flash up on the screen for a short amount of time, just long enough for you to get a single glance at those letters. And then I'd just like you to write down, or if you don't have a pen, just keep in your mind the letters that you saw. Okay? So here's the cross, looking at the cross. And so now just take a moment to write down the letters that you saw. Okay, so this is the grid that comes up that you in fact saw. And just take a moment to see how well you did in that experiment. Okay, who got all 12? Someone's seen the slides before. Okay. Who got one? Quite a lot of you. Okay, who got three or more? Okay, again, a lot of you. Who got five or more? Just a handful, okay. So, pretty good audience, actually. Good for UCL. The standard finding here is that subjects are able, in displays like this, to uh, write down, to report, just four letters on average. And many theorists have taken this to show that our consciousness is pretty severely limited. Okay, we see only four specific letters in displays like this, and more generally, in a single glance, we're only able to take in, experientially, four or so specific features. Okay. Others, though, think these tests are fundamentally flawed as tests of our consciousness. Their complaint is that these tests are really tests of our memories, not tests of our experience. And again, the worry is a worry about distance, not the distance between us and bats that Nagel was concerned about but the temporal distance between us as we're experiencing that grid and us a few seconds later as we're trying to write them down. In the 60s, a pioneering psychologist called George Sperling thought he'd found a way to prove that subjects really do see much more than they can remember. And this is what he did. He showed subjects letter displays exactly like the ones that you've just seen. But shortly afterwards, he played subjects a cue tone. And he said to subjects, if that tone's high, I want you to just write down letters from the top row. If it's medium, the middle row, low, the bottom row. Now, you might expect that, given that the subjects don't know which cue tone's going to come, and it comes on only after the display has been and gone, that subjects are only going to be able to write down a third of the letters that they see across the grid as a whole, right? And so if you think that subjects only see four or so letters across the grid as a whole, they're only going to be able to write down one, perhaps the most two letters in the queued row. But that's not what Sperling found. Sperling found that subjects are able to write down upwards of three letters in a queued row. What he took this to show is that we actually experience most, if not all, the letters in that grid, but can only keep a limited number in our memories. So what the key is doing, in effect, is allowing us to select which of those letters in our rich experience get into our poor memories. So in short, our experience is rich, our memory is poor, and that, I think, is the standard view today. 
Okay, so what I want to do in the rest of the talk is offer a different perspective on that kind of finding and on that issue. It's very natural to think about our experience as kind of breakable down into a series of snapshots, as if our visual system was a bit like a paparazzo's camera, constantly snapping away at the world. Click. If you buy that assumption, you'll think that your experience at some particular moment is completely independent of your experience at any other moment. After all, when asking about your experience at a particular moment, you're just asking which snapshot is before you at that time. And that snapshot here is quite independent of the one next to it. Okay. Applying the same logic to Sperling's experiment, we'll think that our experience of the grid is completely independent of our experience of the tone, of which tone we hear. So one snapshot is the display, another snapshot, the tone. Arguably, however, that way of thinking about experience as made up of a sequence of snapshots is fundamentally mistaken. As William James put it, experience consciousness is nothing jointed. It flows like a stream, a stream of consciousness. There are many reasons for thinking this, but one is the fact that we can see something moving and not merely now being at one place, now at another. From this perspective, the perspective of thinking of consciousness as stream-like rather than, than as a sequence of snapshots, we'll think that consciousness, our experience, is first and foremost of dynamic events unfolding in time. Now, that's not to say that we can't ask, a, ask, ask questions about our experience at a moment, but our answer to that question is going to depend on how our experience is over time. So here's an analogy. So this is a sequence of, of snapshots of a, a woman walking across a beach. They've been stitched together in Photoshop, obviously. Okay, I want you to focus on, on this one on the far right here. So at the moment that that snapshot was taken, that woman was walking across the beach, right? But if you think about it, nothing that's captured by the camera there, nothing about her body position, settles that she's walking as opposed to running, say. You could quite easily imagine another sequence of snapshots where she is running across the beach. So it looks like there's something true of her at that moment that depends fundamentally on what she's doing over time. And it's that same structure I want to suggest is true of our experience. How we're experiencing at a moment depends upon our experience over time. So let's go back to the experiment with that thought in mind. What I want to suggest about this experiment is that the Q-tone has to come so quickly on the heels of the grid within about a third of a second for there to be any effect that we should really think about both together as one complex dynamic event. If that's right, then we can't ask the question about a subject's experience of the display whilst neglecting which tone they're hearing. That would be to ne neglect part of the event they're in the midst of experiencing at that point. And of course, that suggests the idea that maybe the way the subject experiences that display might depend on which tone they hear. In particular, it might be that when the grid, when the display is part of a grid followed by high tone event, it's letters in the top row that are salient. Whereas when the grid is part of a grid followed by low tone event, it's letters in the bottom row that are salient. Okay, if that idea is right, then Sperling hasn't shown us that our experiences are richer than our memories. Rather, what he's shown us is that which letters get to figure in our limited experiences can be changed by a tone played shortly after the display has been presented. And more generally, what I want to suggest is that by thinking of our experiences streamlike rather than as, than as built up from a sequence of independent snapshots, we can start to close the gap that seemed to have opened between our experience and our memory. So perhaps, after all, we can know what it's like to be us. And it's just the bats we have to worry about. Thank you. <laughs>